Good morning everyone and welcome to the 103rd Learn with Lorna where we'll be looking at women in the Loch Aber Archive Centre collections. My name is uh, Lorna Steele McGinn, I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. Learn with Lorna is a series of short films designed to share some of the stories from within our collections to whoever is interested in finding out about them and learning a little bit more about the story of the Highlands and Islands. The Highland Archive Service has four archive centres across the Highlands. We have uh, the Highland Archive and Registration Centre in Inverness. We have Nucleus, the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, Loch Aber Archive Centre in Fort William and Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree. This series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, and we're very grateful for that and there's a link to enable you to do that both in the Facebook stream and also later on when it's uploaded to the YouTube channel. This week as I mentioned last week uh, is pre-recorded because I'm in Loch Aber today speaking to uh, the local Probus group but we're continuing our focus this week on women in the Highland Archive Service collections. This week some examples from women in the collections held in our Loch Aber Archive Centre and we'll come on in the next weeks to look at the Sky and Loch Elsh collections and the Nucleus, uh, the Caithness collections. So the, sca the staff in each office have been choosing who it is that they would like to focus on. So thank you to Rory in Loch Aber Archive Centre for his work on this week's. I know he's really enjoyed pulling together the stories of the women we're going to look at. Now, of course, women feature throughout the Loch Aber Archive Centre collections. They are peppered through them in exactly the same way that men are in terms of school records, uh, poor relief records, family papers, business papers and so on. And so we could have looked really at anything, but Rory has chosen two specific women to focus on, both from family collections, Cameron of Loch Eel and Cameron Head of Inveraylert. In this instance for today's talk, both of these women are from moneyed and landed families, typical of their class, but perhaps not typical of all women. Um, but as we move through this month, we'll look at examples from across society. The two women we're going to be looking at today are Veer Hobart and Christian Cameron. So let's start with Veer. Veer Catherine Louisa Hobart was born in Granada in the West Indies in around 1803. Her mother was Janet Hobart, née McLean, and her father was the Honourable George Veer Hobart, and he, George, Veer's father, was the son of the Earl and Countess of Buckinghamshire, and he was the governor of Grenada, which was why they were there. We have a letter written by Veer's mother to her father, so Veer's grandfather, when baby Veer was five weeks old. And in it, Janet explains uh, that Veer is five weeks old. She was five weeks old last night, she says, and thank God she's very healthy. I've christened her here when she was three weeks old. You may have a guess at her names. They are Veer, Catherine and Louisa for Lady Stuart. Veer's father, uh, George Veer Hobart, died just prior to her birth in December 1802. And Janet explained that that was why she had given baby Veer that slightly unusual first name because it was her, uh, the baby's father's middle name. Janet and George had only married in April 1802. He died in the December and the baby was born uh, in the beginning of 1803. And after George's death, Janet returned home from the West Indies with baby Veer and it's possible that she was actually born on the voyage home. And Janet died not long after getting home in 1804. So Veer was an orphan from a very, very young age, having never known her father and losing her mother at um, around a year old. Now, the documents that we hold in our collections don't go into Veer's childhood or her younger years. We pick her story up again in the 1820s and 30s when she was in her 20s and 30s. Now, we know that during this period, Veer made the acquaintance of Anne Lister, and I've spoken previously about that, uh, their relationship uh, in the Stories of Friendship episode. And it seems, that Anne Lister was very hopeful that their friendship would develop further than a friendship into something more, especially as Veer's connections to both money and titles were very attractive to Anne. But this ambition was 
thwarted in 1832 when Veer accepted a proposal of marriage from Donald Cameron, the 23rd chief of Clan Cameron. He was in, uh, in the Grenadier Guards. He had actually fought at the Battle of Waterloo. And the pair married in July 1832 at St Martin in the Fields Church in London and they settled at the Lochiel home of Achnacari. And it's through this marriage that we have Veer's correspondence and papers, including letters from Anne Lister, with whom she maintained a close friendship after her marriage. Veer was a prolific writer and correspondent, and we hold letters to her from a variety of, of people. Here's an example that I wanted to share with you. This is a letter written to Veer by another woman, Harriet Hageman. It's dated 18th of February, 1831, and it describes the riots that were happening in Paris. These were the, this was the July Revolution in which King, Jar King Charles X was overthrown and replaced by his cousin Louis Philippe, the Duke of Orléans. Now, it was commonly seen, I believe, as a move away from the hereditary, hereditary right to rule and towards popular sovereignty. But I wanted to share this letter with you and, and Rory uh, picked it out as well because it, it feels very, very current, horribly current. So Harriet writes to Veer, Paris, February the 18th, 1831. The events passing do hardly give one time to breathe, particularly when they are acted so near, but thank God the enemies of this deservedly popular king were not allowed to triumph. I make no doubt that they will multiply their wicked schemes, hoping by perseverance to gain their end. However, it will be fruitless, as all must hope, and allow on witnessing the immense moral as well as physical strength opposed to them. The National Guard in themselves are a rampart not to be overcome. We went on Wednesday to witness the devastation of the church and the bishop's palace, which, re which presents the most dismal sight of burned walls, broken windows partly unroofed, as if a great fire without smoke had raged through it. Many pictures and precious things were carried from the church into the Louvre as soon as the National Guard was sufficiently master of the people to do so. So it's a very emotive document. That's only an extract from it, but it's quite an emotional description of witnessing civil unrest and upheaval and somebody writing home about both their feeling of where the moral strength in the fight lay and also that taking away the destruction of buildings and the taking away of precious objects to keep them safe. As I say, all of which feels incredibly current. Now, Veer and her husband Donald had six children. They had Anne Louisa, Julia Veer, Sibella Matilda, Albiana Mary, Donald, who went on to become a Conservative MP and the 24th Clan Chief, and George Hamden. In addition to being a regular writer of letters, Veer was a dedicated diary writer as well, and we hold numerous of her diaries, which detail both her own daily life and also global events. So, for instance, there is an entry uh, in July 16, no, July 1864, which describes Veer's journey from London uh, to Achnacari with Sibella. She describes leaving the house in London at 8.15 and then having the fun of waiting at Euston until 10 for an express train which the Bradshaw had said left at 9. So that's something we can all identify with. Okay, I got here early, I thought this was the train time and it's not, so now I'm just killing time. She then says that the train from then on kept time punctually all day and she didn't change carriage until she got to Perth. She says it's not very warm but it was wonderfully dusty. She describes dining at Preston. She describes the other passengers who are sharing the carriage with her. She says there's an old man clo uh, clothed in grey Then says I was alone until Carluke and then two women uh, came on train until Perth and they were drinking sherry all the way. She then goes on to describe on from Dalwini uh, and then to Achnacari by horse. So just someone keeping a daily diary of what they're doing, but really interesting contemporary travel information. Um, and also, I think, evidence is the fact that we've always people watched on trains. There she is describing all the people that go past her and come in and sit near her. But as well as those day to day things, Veer's diaries also give an insight into contemporary empirical opinions. 
on global events. This strongly worded extract is from July is from August, sorry, 1857, and it gives differing views on the Indian mutiny. She has written in her diary, Hamilton is a shriveled, smoke-dried, cross-looking old diplomatist on the Indian mutiny. So she goes on to say the conversation talks about the, the Indian mutiny. It took up a shocking bad tone, saying that it was all our fault. Everyone foresaw the consequences of our misrule, insulting their religion, cheating them of bata uh, and pay. It's curious to hear the various opinions on this momentous subject, she writes. Yesterday I dined at Checkers. Mr. Capel Cure took me to dinner. Um, and by a complete contrast to Mr. Hamilton, being young and good looking and looks good, not battered and wizened, he spoke hopefully of India and abused Lord Ellenborough, who's the former Governor General of India, for his intemperate fault finding and harassing the government, especially seeing that he was far from perfect in his management of India and perhaps he sowed the seeds of this very outbreak. So differing opinions uh, on a a difficult subject, um, the, the British time in India, but interesting to see how central Veer was to that conversation. She's not excluded from the political conversation. She's at Checkers. She's sitting round a table having a conversation with people with differing opinions about something that was hugely important at the time. So very interesting to see her in that conversation, I think. In another entry um, dated from 1855, Veer gives her opinion on something else that feels, again, incredibly current. She's talking about the Crimean War. And she says, oh, this terrible war, it has already mowed down the flower of our army and shed some of the best blood in England. Cathcart, Bentick, Percy, Levison Gower, Pakenham, Blair, and a fearful list in the three battles of Alma, Balaclava and Inkerman. We call these victories, but what, at what a price? So yeah, again, very current. We call them a victory, but at what price uh, to life? I mentioned Veer's children, uh, and we can see her role as a mother in this collection as well. In a letter written uh, to Veer by her eldest son, Donald, while studying at Harrow, I just thought it was a classic um, mother-child conversation. He asks after the animals at home. He describes having seen a beautiful bull. He says it's a roan with a back as straight as a line, absolutely beautiful. But then he goes on to tell his mum his big news. He says, fancy, I began to shave the other day. I had horrible misgivings that I was going to cut my throat, but I got off without a cut of any sort and I thought myself lucky. So just exactly the sort of uh, conversation that people have uh, with their mum. Another letter from that same son, Donald, some years later in 1874, when uh, he was aged about 39, sees him confiding in his mother about a secret engagement. But there's perhaps a bit of a hint that their relationship has been slightly strained. He says, my dearest mother, you will be made quite happy about me at last. I have had the great good fortune to receive Margaret Scott's affection and we are now an engaged couple. Perhaps I ought to have told you before that I cared about her, but knowing that you could do me no good and fearing that it would only make you more unhappy about me if it did not come off. I thought it best to keep my feelings to myself as far as you were concerned. There have been difficulties in the way, but through the great kindnesses, especially of Lady Dalkeith, kindness for which I can never sufficiently be grateful. These difficulties have all been smothered away, and I suppose by return of this post, we shall obtain the Duke and Duchess's consent, and then all will go well. So please don't say anything to anyone until you hear from me again. The difficulties were, as you will guess, entirely of a financial character. And though this may su perhaps surprise you, knowing on what my father married, and that since then the rental of the estate has greatly increased, yet I fear it has not increased commensurately, either with the cost of everything or with the luxuriousness of the age in which we live. However, at Lady Delkeith's request, I put the whole thing plainly and fairly before the Duke, and he said he was satisfied, and if his daughter's happiness was at stake, he would not oppose the marriage. So it only remains for me now to say how thoroughly happy I am. It's interesting there that, that um, you know, you're disappointed in me, you're not happy with me. Obviously, I have no idea what that was about, but it, you do wonder with him being 39 and being the heir to the estate and the title, if it was around uh, a need for him to be married and to be producing an heir. 
Donald and Margaret did indeed marry in 1875 and went on to have four sons, so making Veer a grandmother. Now, Veer died in November 1888, leaving behind her evidence of her role as a friend, a confidant, a wife, a mother, and also witness to some of the biggest events that had happened uh, in that period. The second woman that I wanted to tell you about has some similarities to that. Uh, she also was a wife, a mother, and a witness to some of the most momentous events in world history, and where Veer witnessed some of the big occasions in the, uh, the 19th century. The second lady we're going to talk about witnessed the big events of the 20th century. Christian Cameron was born in 1859. She was the eldest daughter of Duncan Cameron of Inverailort and Alexandrina Marion Gillespie. The Inverailort estate and house in uh, Inverailort Castle passed to Christian on her father's death in 1874. She was aged 15. So in this instance, she was the one that brought the estate, the land, the castle. The estate was managed, uh, was managed initially by a family trust but she was able to take over the running in around about 1888. And in 1890, Christian married James Head, who was an ex-army captain and a director of a number of shipping companies. In 1896, she gave birth to twins, a boy called Francis and a girl also called Christian. In 1910, Christian Cameron and James Head amalgamated their names by royal licence to become the Cameron Heads, much like the Fraser Titlers. And so this collection, like the Fraser Titler of Aldowry collection, this collection is called the Cameron Head of Inverailort collection. So that the, both strands of that family story coming together in the collection name and the family name. Between 1912 and 1914, Christian Cameron Head took a strong interest in women's suffrage. She joined the Conservative and Unionist Party, uh, the Women's Franchise, collecting a great deal of information and literature on the subject. And it's really, really evident in these papers how much the backing of these prominent women mattered to the suffrage cause. Here's a letter from Dame Louise Victoria Samuel. She was the Honorary Secretary of the Conservative Women's Franchise Association, a member of Chelsea Borough Council and founder of the War Refugees Committee at the outbreak of World War I. Uh, Lady or Dame, Louise, uh, Dame Louise Victoria Samuel was awarded an OBE for her refugee work and then a DBE during the war uh, in the war honours that were awarded to civilians. So in 1920, there were specific war honours uh, awarded to civilians. And she was awarded a DBE in that, again, for her work with refugees. And in this letter, she's writing to Christian Cameron Head, explaining her hope that Christian will come on side with the women's suffrage campaign. Mrs Cameron Head of Inverailort, dear Mrs Cameron Head, this is dated uh, 20th of November 1912, dear Mrs Cameron Head, I am enclosing a circular with reference uh, to the International Women's Franchise Club, of which I am a member of the committee. It would be a great honour and privilege if we might add your name to our list of members, and I really think that you might be interested in our weekly lectures and debates. We have very well-known speakers on all subjects connected with women, such as the general economic and industrial question, co-education, the theatre and all the arts, and we give dinners and receptions from time to time. The rooms at the club are really very comfortable and pleasant, and nice little meals are provided. There is also a magnificent reference library of books in all languages in connection with the women's movement generally. We are so anxious to get influential people like yourself to join us, and I need hardly say how proud I should be if you would let me propose you for the club. So very, very, um, a great insight into such a huge momentous thing in women's history in, in Britain, and that evidence of that desire to have, please, we need people like you on board because you are women of influence, women of standing that will be able to spread the word. And the more people like you we can get on side, the more we can 
uh, spread this message out. I mentioned that she collected a lot of pamphlets and information about women's suffrage at this period. And here's a really interesting extract from one of the suffrage uh, pamphlets relating to the largely peaceful nature of the suffragist movement. It says, uh, if, a gr if a great joint, I'll start that again. If a great joint protest meeting could be arranged at the Albert or Queen's Hall, it would be advisable. But it goes on to say, so they're saying they want to have a protest about the situation, but they go on to say all attempts to boycott tradesmen and to walk about without hats or similar ideas should be suppressed and even repudiated by serious organisations. These ideas simply bring ridicule upon the whole movement and do it an infinite amount of harm. And that was something, to, to put it simplistically, and it is more complex than that, that was often seen as the difference between the suffragist and the suffragette movement, that one was um, more peaceful and more about negotiation and persuasion uh, rather than taking uh, aggressive action. So already this lady is a landowner, she is um, a, a mother and a wife, she's now entering into the suffrage movement. And then when World War I broke out, Christian Cameron Head found her attention pulled to another conflict and another battle altogether. In Verailer Estate, lands were requisitioned by the Board of Agriculture in World War I, and the land was designated for sheep farming to counter the food shortages that the country was facing. And Christian Cameron Head took huge exception to this. She wrote a flurry of letters about the subject. And here is one written to a Mr Fletcher in which she voices her feelings about this situation. Dear Mr Fletcher, it's many years since we've met and I dare say you do, you do not remember me as Miss Cameron of Inveraylort. Still, I am making bold to write to you because I see that you're a chairman of the Russia Valuation Committee and presided when the case of the Atterdale Forest was under discussion. Is it really the case, as was stated in the papers, that the Scottish Board of Agriculture have taken 13,100 acres of the Attadale Forest and entered themselves as proprietors at £100, leaving the old proprietor only 1,700 acres. They have been trying something similar here, which is my reason for troubling you, and I hear of other threats. They have, alas, in the same high-handed manner, confiscated grazings belonging to Lord Forbes in Aberdeenshire. All we proprietors have done and given all in our power to help forward the war and for the Scottish Board of Agriculture to dislocate and paralyse the working of our estates in addition to a, in addition is a poor return as the board gives no definite undertaking that they will provide more food for the nation than we have provided already in the present emergency. In fact, the board cannot possibly provide more food for the nation for two or three years from sheep newly put on forest ground whereas the venison is actually an already existing and valuable food. So she's, she's writing there saying, look, we've, please consult with, with us about how to do this. It's not that we're opposed to, to supporting the war effort and to providing food, but if by grazing sheep on our land, that's going to have a knock-on effect in a couple of years, whereas I've actually got a deer farm here with venison on it that I'm happy to provide to counter the, the food shortages. Here's another letter written to a Mr Malcolm and she's trying to convey again why she thinks this plan won't work and why they should instead focus on use of venison and deer. Dear Mr Malcolm, this is uh, September 1917, Dear Mr Malcolm, thank you so very much for the most interesting literature and for your views on the future of deer forests after these troublesome times. The swing of the pendulum is my hope and a playground for wealth will someday be wanted, although I fear that there are many year, lean years ahead. I agree with you that in the high and profitable ground when, where there, I agree with you that in high unprofitable ground where uh, there's one acre of arable to every thousand of mountain, that cattle grazing, sheep forests and afforestation, not sheep which will require wintering at prohibitive expense and even then will die, will be the only way in which the land can be used and the rates paid. Smallholders can never make a livelihood out of the ground, for they cannot take it out of, out of it what is not there, a livelihood. So they can't 
they can't make a living out of something that doesn't have a, the capacity for a living in it. When Lloyd George was raging against using pheasants, etc., before the war, I wrote to the Times and said that his hope of using the Highlands for small holdings could only be realised if he gave the nation back their old and time-honoured right of raiding and cattle lifting, without which they had never been able to support themselves. A good many people wrote to me protesting that the Highlands had been self-supporting under the chiefs, but history is against them, and they had to bow down to the fact that we lived by raiding the fat beeves of the South and could not have done without them. And if land could then could not satisfy the natives, how much more could how much could it do so now when they require and demand so much more in the way of luxuries? Do you not consider that sheep are unprofitable when wintering has to be resorted to? And in the hoar frost zone here where they die like flies, we can grow fat venison and summer splendidly a herd of cattle for sale at the back end, but there is no wintering here for cattle or sheep, and only the deer can eke out a precarious livelihood. So what I find particularly interesting about that, regardless of uh, the opinions around how the Highlands is able to be self-supporting, but what's very interesting about that is this is not her husband writing these letters. This is Christian Camerhead entirely in charge of her own estate, writing to the Board of Agriculture, writing to the valuation boards and putting across her points. So she obviously had a huge amount of control over what was happening. Uh, in the management of the estates, except perhaps in the face of uh, the, the War Office. She would then later go on to seek compensation for the damage that had been caused to the estate during World War I. Now, throughout all of this, and I've mentioned already a range of things she's involved in, throughout all of this, Christian Cameron Head was carrying out another interest. She was a world-renowned dog breeder particularly of West Highland White Terriers and Elk Hounds. She ran kennels in the Inverell grounds and sold her dogs worldwide. And she was uh, featured in numerous magazines on this subject. And this extract I wanted to share with you is from the Gentlewoman magazine, 1916. Uh, and it's from an article entitled Mrs Cameron Heads Kennel of West Highland Terriers. And it describes Inverell and Mrs Cameron Head herself. There is a very fine deer forest on the estate and it is well known for its excellent sea trout and salmon fishing. The castle stands on Loch Eilert, a beautiful arm of the sea running like a Norwegian, Norwegian fjord five miles inland from the Atlantic and the loch is an ideal place for yachting. Mrs Cameron Head is a member of the Ladies Automobile Club, the Sesame Club and the Women's Institute. She is much interested in the splendid work now being done by the women's movement for patriotic motives and is one of the vice presidents of the Red Cross for Invernessshire and the recruiting officer under Lord Darby's scheme for the Inverellort district. Her principal hobbies are music, reading, hunting and fishing. As many shows are held when Mrs Cameron Head is in Scotland, she has had to refuse invitations to judge, but she has officiated twice at the Great Joint Terrier Show and in 1914 at Manchester. So you really get a sense of the amount of things that she was involved in. She appears to have been stringent on her views on a wide range of subjects, including animals uh, and the dog breeding. And there was letters uh, written from her about her very strong views on the correct way to breed animals and in inferior animals that had been sold to her. Now, World War I breaking out meant that she could no longer sell dogs to America. And so she reduced the price of all the, the animals that she had and sold them for the benefit of the Cameron Highlanders and the British Red Cross. And again, as we saw with Veer, there's some things in here that are so very current of people taking what they do in their daily life and trying in some way to make that benefit uh, other people during a war effort. And of course, after World War I came World War II, and that was to be no easier for Christian Cameron Head. In 1940, both Inverell Lort Castle and Glensheehan House, which is another uh, house on the estate, were again requisitioned, this time for special military training. And in a letter that uh, Christian Cameron Head wrote to the then Donald Cameron of Loch Eel, Veer's grandson, uh, she describes her desperation at the situation that's unfolding. This is written on the 10th of June, 1940, to Loch Eel. 
Dear Donald, I am writing to you in great tribulation, although I fear that there is little that you can do except advise. I've been in London with Francis for his operations, this is her son, and on leaving my hotel to return here on the 30th of May, the Morning Post brought me a letter from High Command saying that they had, t they had taken Inveraylort and Glensheen House and all the furniture had been taken out of both houses. Being on my way to the station, I could do nothing but come straight on, and when I arrived at Loch Aylort Station, there were only two officers who said the castle was already half emptied and they had no accommodation for me and I could not go to the castle. They have taken my three garages and they planted tents everywhere, even in the very middle of the farmyard, without any permission from me or anyone representing me. The whole of the furniture has gone to stores in Fort William. There seems to be no one really in command here except a nice Captain Stacy who can do nothing except order the men to proceed with the clearing of the houses. The officers are going to live at the castle and there are some 70 to 80 tents for the men as well, at Glen, as, well as Glensheen House. Can you tell me anyone who I can apply to for assistance? I know that the furniture has gone and, as you may imagine, the rough drive to Fort William has not improved it or the China. It's difficult because when you read that, you part of you sort of goes, my word, your, your problems are not nearly as bad as the problems of the people who were fighting at the front, and at least you had a castle to give up. Um, but then you put yourself in that state and you imagine what it would be like to get a message saying, you can't come home because your home's been taken over. We've taken all your furniture out and you can't come back in. And so I think we need to have a lot of sympathy with how that would feel to any one of us. Now, her last le sentence in that letter to Lochiel, she says, the furniture's gone and the rough drive to Fort William will not have improved it or the China. Now, in actual fact, that last sentence was very, very accurate and much of the furniture and the contents were lost or damaged in transit. And she wrote to the War Office about this. And she says, I do not wish to embark on any altercation with the War Office, but I would like uh, you to protest for me that I had no notice whatever, only just as I was getting into the train to come to Inverailor after many weeks of anxiety, because she's obviously had many weeks of anxiety about her son, who's had an operation. I had engaged servants and will have to pay them wages without seeing them. And I have literally nowhere to put away any of my possessions. I only have the luggage I was traveling with. I am now told we will not be able to approach the castle once the military are installed and the damage that has been done to the furniture and to the house generally and having hundreds of men in the castle and Glensheen House surely ought to be put down as a debt against someone. Would you kindly return the papers I sent you and simply notify the War Office, if you consider it wise, of the damage that has been done and the fact that I have no roof over my head. Christian went to live with her sister uh, when this happened and she died in 1941 of a heart attack, but was described at the time as dying of a broken heart as a result of the damage that had been to, done to her house in World War II and she was never able to return to the castle before her death at the age of 81. So again, we see there, much like Veer, a woman who was a member of society, a wife, a mother, um, a member of a landed family, and a witness to living through some of the most extraordinary times in our history. And I think, um, both of those stories are, are so important. It's so important that we have them, that we have kept them. And of course, so important now that we continue to document the lives of people who are living through the momentous things we have lived through as a, as a country, as a planet in the last uh, few years. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about Veer Cameron and about Christian Cameron Head. As I said, thank you so much to Rory for picking those two women to talk about and then um, doing some research into them for me. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you can join me next week when we'll be looking at Women in the Sky and Loch Alsh collections. But a reminder in the meantime that this series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of events. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then please do. We would be very, very grateful. Thank you.